body. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. I'm your host, Josh. As always, I'm joined in the studio by my producer, Joel. And today we got another sort of different episode for you. Not quite sure what you all are going to think about this one, but I thought it was both interesting and terrifying at the same time. We're going to be looking at the 10 strangest ways to die. Before we get into that, though, I just had a few announcements to make. For those of you that have been wondering where milehiremerch.com went, it is down right now, but it will be back hopefully by the end of May with some new items too, some new designs, some new stuff uh, will be released at that point, but more on that later. Also quickly, I just wanted to thank you all for the feedback on my first interview episode here on Lights Out with Terry Huberman. Really enjoyed that one, to be honest with you. And it was great to see all the feedback that we got on it. And I definitely want to explore having more interviews on the show in the future. So with that being said, if you know of anybody, especially if they live here in Colorado, that would be really convenient because then I could bring them into the studio uh, because that's the way I prefer to do interviews. I think it's just much more authentic and more enjoyable to listen to and watch versus over zoom or something like that where there's like a delay and and sometimes the audio quality is not the greatest so and it's just so much more personal in person yeah exactly exactly so i would prefer to be able to bring people here into my studio here in denver so if you know anybody in the denver area that'd be interesting to talk to or maybe you're somebody who listens to the show and you're like hey you know i'm an expert in this or i'm a psychic medium definitely want to know there is a link uh in our description for uh ways to contact me um and i'll link that below but i think that's all i have for announcements today this episode of lights out is brought to you by credit karma stamps.com cat person and hello fresh so whether you're sucked through a 20 inch opening under 25 tons of pressure or cooked inside of a commercial pressure cooker under 25,000 pounds of tuna according to murphy's law if anything can go wrong it will here are 10 of the strangest deaths in human history. And for our own sake, we hope they can't get any stranger. Before we jump into this first death, I just want to give a word of caution. This episode is graphic in nature, so if any of this is very disturbing to you, I would advise probably not uh, watching or listening to this any further. So you've been warned. Our first death on the list is a gruesome lesson in underwater pressure and how the slightest mistake can lead to the biggest disasters. The Biford Dolphin was a semi-submersible drilling rig that operated in the North Sea. It could drill down to 20,000 feet and operate underwater at 1,500 feet. Drilling rigs often operate in unpredictable weather conditions hundreds of miles out to sea, and their pipelines deliver millions of barrels of oil every single day. So the rigs need skilled divers to secure underwater pipelines with clamps and cables. And without highly trained divers, these oil rigs wouldn't be able to operate. In the case of the Biford Dolphin accident, four divers were down in the diving chamber system on the rig's deck. Their names were Edwin Arthur Coward, age 35, Roy Lucas, age 38, Bjorn Bergeson, who was 29, and Truls Helovic, who was age 34. Two dive tenders also assisted them, William Crammond and Martin Saunders. The diving system was made up of three chambers connected to a diving bell at the bottom of the rig. The diving bell is a small area where divers enter and exit the open water below, and it's connected by a cable that can lower and raise the compartment down into the water. To keep the pressure safe and consistent through the entire diving rig, the divers had to follow a strict procedure so they wouldn't lethally decompress the chambers. They were all experienced divers and had followed the procedure before, but one small mistake ended up in catastrophe. On November 5th, 1983 at 4 a.m., the two dive tenders were out in the water ready to bring up the diving bell. Two divers on the ocean floor, Bjorn and Truls, were told to make their way back into the diving chambers because bad weather was on the way. So they returned to the diving bell and made their way back into the diving chamber. The two other divers were resting in a nearby chamber, and for an unknown reason, William, one of the diving tenders, didn't follow the procedure. Many divers suffer from mental fatigue after working for hours at these depths, which I can't even imagine what that must be like. Underwater pressure, long work hours, and exhaustion from diving and swimming can take their toll, and many believe William wasn't thinking clearly when he made the fatal mistake. 
He opened the small clamp to the diving bell before Trules could close the door to the diving chamber. What seemed like a tiny mistake ended in an explosive decompression throughout the entire chamber system. The pressure inside went from nine atmospheres down to one in an instant. All of the air rapidly rushed out of the system and three of the divers inside the chambers died instantly. What the f is that? Okay, blow yourselves down. Blow yourselves down in a bell. Blow yourselves down. What the f is that? Yeah, you got a leak. Shut yourselves down. Shut it down. The decompression was so intense that it boiled their blood and killed them on the spot. As for the diving tenders out in the water, the diving bell shot down from the diving rig with tremendous force, and it crashed into both of them on the way down. William died almost instantly and Martin was severely injured, but he ended up being the only survivor. As for Trules, the diver closest to the area of decompression, his entire body was sucked through a 20 inch opening under 25 tons of force, and as he shot through the small opening, his body was completely obliterated. Luckily, he died instantly, but the rescue divers who witnessed the aftermath could barely find all of his body parts. When rescue teams recovered his remains, his face, skin, bones, brains, and guts were collected into four separate body bags. He had been forced through the hole under so much force that they found body parts as far as 30 feet above the diving chambers. His spinal column and most of his ribs were found on the deck, and his pelvis had been divided into three parts. All of his intestines had been torn from his body and his genitals were found inside out. From the intensity of the decompression explosion, his brain was filled with gas and fat. The autopsy stated that it resembled butter on a frying pan. The rest of his remains were scattered around the diving system. All of the dead divers were eventually recovered, and an investigation into what happened began. At first, they believed the mistake was only human error. But years later, in 2008, an investigation uncovered that the divers had been working with faulty equipment and it took 26 years for the families of the victims to finally receive any sort of compensation. The tragedy became a wake-up call for diving safety, fail-safe equipment, and proper communication when securing different diving chambers. It was also a lesson in the incredible and sometimes terrifying power of physics and decompression. One of the most bizarre deaths happened while two sisters were on vacation in Spain. In 2005, British sisters Mildred Bowman who was 62, and Alice Wardle, who was 68, decided to stay at a holiday resort in Benidorm, Spain. They enjoyed spending time together and traveling in their golden years, and the summer weather was perfect in Spain. The room they stayed in had two Murphy beds, which if you don't know what a Murphy bed is, it's a type of bed that folds up into a wall. Some Murphy beds have hollow frames, but the one at the resort had a solid wooden structure built around it, which was attached to both of the beds. Their vacation went on as usual. They sat by the pool and ordered drinks and food. But after several days, people noticed the sisters hadn't been seen in a while. Friends even came by their room and slid notes under their front door, hoping they would respond. They even searched everywhere across the resort, but still no one had heard or seen the sisters. After several days, the resort staff became concerned since the cleaning crew had been knocking on their door for days without a response. The women had gone missing on Sunday, and the resort staff finally decided to enter the room on the following Thursday. They feared the worst, and what they found was a very grisly scene. A foul smell had filled the room as the staff entered, and as they turned the corner, they saw the fate of Alice and Mildred. The two sisters had been buried in their own Murphy beds. The solid wooden structure around the beds had collapsed on top of them and trapped them inside. The staff quickly contacted the police and as police officers investigated the scene, they lifted the heavy frame off of the women. Their faces were pale and thin, and their mouths were open like they had been screaming or struggling for air, and their hands were covered in cuts and bruises, which meant they were most likely slamming their hands against the wooden structure, trying to free themselves. Despite their desperate attempts, the frame wouldn't budge, as it was far too heavy for them. The space they were trapped in was roughly the same as being inside of an MRI machine. They could barely move, and they had just enough oxygen to survive for as long as possible. The autopsy showed that they had suffocated to death sometime between 11 p.m. Wednesday night and 2 a.m. Thursday morning, 
meaning they had been trapped in the bed frames for nearly four days straight. As police looked into how the bed frames fell, they initially believed the sisters had lowered the bed incorrectly, but they were never given instructions on how to unfold the bed properly. Investigators later found that the screws and wall plugs on the wall-mounted storage unit were not fit correctly. But by the end of the investigation in December 2008, a Spanish court cleared the holiday resort owners of wrongdoing, and the deaths of Alice and Mildred became just another tragic freak accident. The next death on the list would become Bumblebee Foods' most expensive cooking operation to date. Bumblebee is most known for its canned seafood products. We've all eaten them, probably. But in 2012, they became known for one of the most horrific accidental deaths in a workplace environment. Jose Molina was a 62-year-old employee at the Bumblebee facility in Santa Fe Springs, California. He was known as a good worker, and he had a wife and six children. On October 11, 2012, Jose began working the night shift at 4 in the morning. When he first arrived for a shift, his boss asked him to clean up and perform maintenance on one of their 35-foot industrial pressure cookers. They used these massive cookers to cook and sterilize large amounts of canned fish. At some time between 4 and 5 a.m., he entered the pressure cooker to perform his duties. While inside, one of his coworkers noticed an empty pallet jacket beside the pressure cooker, and he assumed that Jose had finished cleaning and repairing the cooker, and that it was ready to be used again. So the coworker began loading 12,000 pounds of canned tuna into the cooker, not knowing that Jose was still inside. Jose tried to scramble out, but the fish was being loaded so quickly that he was most likely crushed by the weight and couldn't escape. Even if Jose had screamed for help, it was unlikely that his coworkers could have heard him. The machinery inside the facility was so loud that it drowned out his screams, and many of the workers wore hearing protection. So he screamed into the void as the cans came crashing down on him. As he panicked, he knew his fate was sealed when the coworker closed the pressure cooker doors. The cooker turned on a few seconds later and began cooking the tuna, with Jose still inside. The pressure cooker quickly made its way to 270 degrees Fahrenheit and ran for two hours. All the while, Jose was cooked to death in the back of the pressure cooker. It's still a mystery how long he survived inside, but it wasn't an instantaneous death. He most likely survived for several minutes crushed behind the 12,000 pounds of tuna cans. Plus, the tuna cans were made of aluminum, so as the heat inside the cooker rose, so did the metal cans pushed up against his skin. Meanwhile, the workday at the facility went on as normal. His coworker had no idea that he had just cooked Jose alive. But after an hour, the rest of the coworkers noticed that Jose was missing. They paged him and searched around the facility but couldn't find him. And when the pressure cooker finished cooking after two hours, they finally checked inside. As they removed the 12,000 pounds of canned tuna, they found his charred remains in the back end of the cooker. His skin had melted and turned black, and in the aftermath of his death, Jose's family received $1.5 million from the company. Criminal charges were filed against multiple managers who were later sentenced to several years of probation. And in the end, Bumblebee agreed to pay $6 million to settle criminal charges which became the largest payout in a California workplace death. And the deputy district attorney said she had tried more than 40 murder cases in the last two decades, and this was the worst circumstance of death that she had ever seen. Out of all the violent gunshots and stab wounds she had come across, nothing compared to the man being cooked alive inside a commercial pressure cooker. The next death is an iconic way to die, rather than a horrific one. It's the theatrical death of a legendary playwright, and his death was as dramatic as his life on stage. John Baptiste Poquelon was a 1600s French playwright. He was better known by the stage name, Moliere. He was also an actor and a poet, and regarded as one of the greatest writers in the French language. He was known for his onstage comedies, and many of his written works are still performed today. In 1622, he was born into a wealthy family and lived a simple life. And by the time he went to college, he was ready to begin his life in the theater. At the time, joining the theater meant giving up your social class. Theater people were seen as poor and dirty by the upper class. They were literally the hippies of their time. And much of his theater troupe lived rugged lifestyles without much money. But his parents were still very rich. By 1645, his theater troupe went bankrupt. And he had gained so much debt that he was thrown in jail for 24 hours. But by some miracle, he was let free and all of his debts disappeared. Many believe his father had secretly bailed him out and paid all of his debts. 
After his short stay in jail, he quickly returned to his dreams of being in the theater. And by the next decade, he had made a name for himself. After years of struggling, he finally became famous for his incredible sense of humor and unique way of writing. He even performed before the French king at the Louvre. Most of the people in Paris loved his plays, but the local churchmen became his harshest critics. He would often make fun of the Catholic faith, and his comedies gained so much attention that the Catholic Church denounced his plays as religious hypocrisy. Some of his plays were even banned by the courts. But Moliere saw this as an accomplishment. By 1667, he was known throughout the world, but his health steadily began to decline. He was forced to take a break from acting, but he continued writing new material. He suffered from tuberculosis for much of his life, which many thought he contracted while in prison for his debts nearly 20 years before. But despite his poor health, he decided to return to the stage. So on February 17, 1673, he performed his last act. The play was titled, The Imaginary Invalid. Halfway through the performance, he collapsed on stage in a fit of coughing. He heaved and heaved as he lost his breath and he noticed a bit of blood spit out of his mouth as he coughed into his hands. This shocked the crowd, but they thought it might have been part of the performance since the play was about a sick man. Moliere recovered from his coughing fit and brushed it off. Even though the rest of his theater troupe was worried about him, he decided to finish his performance. He splashed a bit of water on his face and returned to the stage. But by the play's last lines, another coughing fit attacked him. He sat in a chair as he coughed through his final lines, and blood dripped from his mouth. By now, he was severely bleeding internally, and his illness had destroyed his insides. But the show must go on. He finished his lines as the curtains closed, and he slumped in his chair. Exhausted, he fainted, and blood continued to fall from his mouth and down onto his green wardrobe. Members of his theater troupe hoisted him up on the chair, carried him out of the theater and all the way back to his home. They raised him up like a king on his throne, and by the time he got home, he had died. From then on, there's a superstition that the color green brings bad luck to actors because that was the color he wore on the night of his death. Days later, when his wife tried to find a burial place for him, French law forbid actors to be buried in the sacred ground of a cemetery. They were seen as enemies of the church, which had a lot of influence at the time on local law. But his wife asked the king if he could be granted a normal funeral at night, and he agreed. He was buried in the section of the cemetery reserved for unbaptized infants, and his death became iconic in the world of theater, and his dedication to finishing his last play showed just how much passion he had for his craft. The next death we're going to talk about is one we've all had nightmares about. It's similar to being eaten alive, but by a completely unnatural machine. Jill Grenninger was a 35-year-old woman employed at Economy Locker Storage in Pensdale, Pennsylvania. Inside the factory, they used industrial meat grinders, which had large openings at the top where large animal parts could be fed through. A series of spiral blades would eviscerate the meat as it fell through the giant machine. And by the end of the process, the meat would exit near the bottom, completely ground up into a meat paste. On April 22nd, 2019, Jill worked her shift inside the facility, and what happened next wasn't caught on camera or witnessed by another employee. No one knows exactly how Jill fell into the machine but she was standing on a rolling staircase next to one of the meat grinders that had an opening nearly six feet above the ground. She might have had a piece of her clothing caught in the machine, or she just accidentally fell off the rolling staircase and into the opening. Either way, she had flipped upside down and became trapped head first as the sharp spiral blades began pulling her body further into the machine. A nearby employee heard loud mechanical noises coming from across the factory, and she heard Jill's skull and jawbone snapping as the machine struggled to grind up her body. The machine wasn't made to process bones, but it kept pulling her into its death trap. The coworker heard the commotion and stopped what they were doing. They walked over to the machine, and when they looked up at the top, they noticed Jill's legs sticking out. Blood sprayed out of the machine as it still tried to pull in Jill's body, inch by inch. The coworker cut power to the meat grinder and immediately called 911. But by the time they arrived, Jill had been dead for quite a while. Since she fell head first, she hopefully died instantly. But how she was first pulled into the machine is still a mystery. Firefighters worked for nearly an hour as they took apart the machine piece by piece. As they tried recovering what was left of Jill's body, they noticed that her head was completely gone. 
The machine had processed her head into a disgusting paste of bones, blood, and brains. And the image of her being caught head first in the grinder would stick with her coworker and the firefighters forever. Jill was loved by her friends and family, and they were, of course, shocked to hear how horrifically she died. They were also surprised that something like this could have happened in a modern-day workplace. Not long after her death, officials from the Occupational Safety and Health Administration opened up an investigation into the facility that had operated for nearly 100 years. Even though Jill's death was the first one ever reported at Economy Locker Storage Company, they found 11 serious health and safety violations but the company was only fined $49,000. It's unknown whether the family sued the company or they settled out of court, but her death will always be proof that sometimes what we think could only happen in gory slasher movies can also happen in real life. I have a very busy schedule and the last thing that I have time for is planning out my meals or going grocery shopping, let alone cooking and cleaning up. But that's where HelloFresh has come in so many times to save the day and allow me to eat a home cooked, fresh and delicious meal super easily in under 30 minutes or less. You can get farm fresh seasonal produce and easy to make recipes delivered right to your door every week with HelloFresh. Ingredients travel from the farm to your doorstep in under a week so they always arrive fresh, all without a trip to the grocery store or farmer's market. I gotta tell you, and I can say this with a lot of confidence, I've been using HelloFresh for several years now. Their produce is better than the produce at my local grocery store, hands down. Their meat's honestly better as well. I love HelloFresh because everything comes pre-portioned. I don't have to measure anything out. It's just there. It's just pour this in, stir this up. There's no measuring. There's none of that extra time-wasting things you normally have to do when cooking. HelloFresh makes it super easy. Plus, I don't waste any food because I only cook enough for my wife and I. And once we have a baby, we'll probably upgrade to the family plan, which is great. They have different plans for different things, different nutritional needs. They've got you covered all the way around. So go to HelloFresh.com slash LightsOut16 and use code LightsOut16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. You're going to want to try this. Take advantage today and go to HelloFresh.com slash LightsOut16 and use code LightsOut16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. And our last sponsor for today is Stamps.com, one of my favorite sponsors, very loyal to us and taking good care of us over the years. Plus, I absolutely love their service. I don't have time to waste, so going to the post office is never on my list of things to do, especially now that I've used stamps.com for the past couple of years. I don't think I've been to the post office in like three years now. And I still get all my packages for merch or for my CBD company shipped any day of the week. I need to get it picked up by a post office worker and it's on its way to you all and my customers. Stamps.com is great because it saves me tons of money up to 40% off USPS shipping rates and 76% off UPS rates, which is thousands and thousands of dollars over the course of time. It's great because I don't have to work around the post office hours. I can print, ship, packages any day of the week, 24-7, 365, and they're always ready to go. You don't need any special equipment, just a regular printer and a computer, and you too can start printing official postage for any size package to anywhere you need to send it. So stop overpaying for shipping with stamps.com. Sign up with promo code lights out for a special offer that includes a four week trial, free postage and a digital scale. No long term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com. Click on the microphone at the top of the page and enter code lights out. Most of our deaths in this list have been from freak accidents or medical ailments. But this next death is from sheer nonsense. It's the story of a sailor named John Cummings who was on a ship to France in the summer of 1799. John was a young 23-year-old man full of adventure and stupidity, and he decided to turn his adventure and stupidity into a strange act of showmanship. While aboard the ship, the rest of the crew spotted a massive tent in a field by the shore, so they redirected their ship, anchored it, and approached the tent. They could hear loud cheering and applause, and when they got inside the tent, they noticed a traveling circus was performing a show inside. While looking around, John saw a man pretending to swallow knives in front of a small audience. John was so impressed he couldn't believe his eyes, and he didn't understand that the knives were fake. Once the show was over, the sailors returned to the ship and began drinking from their barrels of ale. By nightfall, they were all super drunk. Inspired by his knife swallower, John drunkenly told his crewmates that he could also swallow knives. The other sailors weren't convinced, and they thought, you know, he was just trying to show off. So they told him to prove it. Confidently, John pulled out a small pocket knife, forced it into his mouth, and swallowed it. He then washed it down with some more ale. 
The rest of the men stood in shock and eventually broke out in cheers and laughter. As the night went on, his crewmates kept giving him pocket knives. They wanted to see him do it again and again. And by the end of the night, John had swallowed three more. The next day, John woke up and went to relieve himself off the side of the boat. Thankfully, he passed one of the pocket knives. And by the next day, he was relieved to pass two more of the pocket knives. But as the days went on, the fourth one never came out. John shrugged it off and went back to his life of being a sailor, never knowing where the fourth knife went. He figured that even if it was still inside him, he would pass it eventually, and he didn't feel any pain. But he thought, you know what? I probably shouldn't swallow any more knives. Over the next six years, he stopped swallowing knives, but of course he couldn't help himself. He liked being the center of attention and accepted by the other sailors. And this trick was the perfect way to get people to like him. In March 1805, John and the rest of the crew were on land drinking in a gathering of sailors when he started bragging about his knife swallowing skills again. When people called him a liar, he brought out another knife and swallowed it immediately. Again, people were shocked and charmed by John's strange ability, and that night he swallowed five more knives. By the following morning, John had become a local celebrity. People from all over town came to see the strange drunken sailor swallow more knives, and he ended up swallowing eight more. By that point, he had swallowed a total of 14 metal knives. To no one's surprise, he woke up the next morning with extreme pain in his stomach. He ran to the closest bathroom and threw up a good amount of blood and small bits of wood. A few other sailors took him to the closest hospital, but he was eventually discharged with no complications. Thinking he was perfectly fine after swallowing knives, he kept doing it. A few months later, in December 1805, someone brought up his knife swallowing skill again. And to prove his bravery, he swallowed four more knives. As the night went on, more and more men pressured him to swallow more and more knives. And so he did. He wasn't afraid and he didn't think the consequences would be too bad. So he swallowed 13 more that night. Just when he thought he was immortal, days passed and he complained to the ship's surgeon that he had a feeling of death inside of him. The surgeon told him to stop swallowing knives and gave him a laxative, hoping that he would pass the knives. But nothing worked. The knives were stuck inside of his intestines. Three months later, he complained of his bowels dropping, and he figured something was seriously wrong. He laid in bed all day in absolute agony, and he couldn't work. So he was soon discharged from his duties as a sailor because of his condition, and three and a half more years passed while he was in horrendous chronic pain. During those years, he went to several more doctors hoping they could help him. He bounced around from hospital to hospital, hoping someone could remove the knives. Some of the doctors didn't believe that he had swallowed knives in the first place. They thought his stories were so stupid that he had to have been lying. Another doctor didn't believe him until he found a small metal fragment inside one of John's intestines. He would vomit and defecate several small fragments of metal and wood throughout the years. Much of them were mixed with blood and other bodily fluids. The doctor knew it would be too dangerous to try and remove the metal fragments by surgery, so they made John drink acid hoping it would dissolve the fragments that were stuck in his intestines. But nothing worked. And John just became sicker and sicker by the day. His skin became pale and his guts bulged with pain. And by the time of his last doctor's visit, he was permanently sent home. And the doctor deemed him incurable, as there was nothing more they could do for him. And in March of 1809, John finally died from internal infections and intense pain. And during his autopsy, they found a full knife blade and a spring inside his intestines, along with 30 to 40 different size fragments. 14 fragments were metal knives, and some of the fragments had pinned themselves into his intestines, and they were impossible to pass. Many wooden handles had partially dissolved, but the metal blades remained in his intestines for years. In the end, no one was really too surprised, but John Cummings left us with a valuable lesson, and it might be an obvious one. Don't swallow knives, people. The next death might also seem like an inspiration for horror movies since its circumstances seem so ridiculous. And this story will prove that having an intense fear of elevators might be a completely rational fear to have. On August 16, 2003, things carried on as usual at Christus St. Joseph Hospital in Houston, Texas. Two of the hospital's employees, 35-year-old Dr. Hitoshi and physician's assistant Karen Steino, waited for an elevator. The elevator they waited for had recently been out of service, but the service sign on the elevator doors had been removed. While they waited, the doctor asked Karen if they had fixed the elevator, and Karen jokingly responded, Well, I sure hope so. As the elevator doors opened, she got on first. 
and the doctor followed her in. But as he stepped into the elevator, the door slammed shut. They pinned his shoulders between the doors, and he couldn't move. Unknown to both of them, the elevator had not been fixed, and the doors had a fatal firing issue. Karen quickly began pressing the emergency stop and open door buttons, frantically trying to get the doors to open so the doctor could get free, but nothing worked. The door squeezed him tighter between the doorway. He tried to push the doors open and squirm his way out of their grasp, but they wouldn't budge. They clamped down on him even harder, and he couldn't escape. If things couldn't get any worse, the elevator began ascending to the next floor. Karen desperately kept smashing the emergency stop button, but the elevator kept rising. The elevator door had held the doctor down while the elevator continued its way up. As the elevator pinched the doctor between the door and the elevator floor, Karen watched helplessly in horror as the top of his head was slowly severed off by the door frame. A loud crack filled the elevator and his head snapped off from the upper jaw as blood poured down the elevator doors. All that was left of his head was his left ear, tongue, lower lips, and lower teeth attached to the rest of his body. Once the top of his head was completely severed, his body plunged all the way to the bottom of the elevator shaft, several stories below. A loud thud came from the bottom of the elevator shaft, and the fall caused his body a spinal fracture and several broken ribs. Karen stood in horror as she had watched the elevator mutilate her colleague, and there was nothing she could do. The elevator eventually stopped between floors four and five. She was then trapped in the elevator for another half hour with the top of the doctor's severed head still inside. The top of his skull, his hair, his nose, his eyes, and his upper teeth sat in a pool of blood on the elevator floor. After the tragedy, Karen developed post-traumatic stress disorder, and the hospital paid for her mental treatment. As for the doctor's family, they sued the hospital and settled for an unknown amount of money. One small wiring error cost him his life. And his tragic story reminds many of us that a fear of elevators might be a healthy fear to have. The next death is a great example of when an irrational fear sinks its way into reality. Jeffrey Bush was a 36-year-old man who lived in Sefner, Florida. He lived in a small sky blue suburban home at 240 Faithway Drive with his brother Jeremy, his sister-in-law, and his niece. The house they lived in was built in the 1970s, and when they first moved in, there was no sign that anything was wrong with the home. But what they didn't realize was that a life-threatening cavity was growing beneath their floors. They went on as usual day to day, while a massive sinkhole crept underneath them, until one night, it began swallowing the house. On February 28, 2013, Jeffrey was asleep in his bedroom around 11 p.m. His brother Jeremy was in a nearby room when he had heard a massive crash come from Jeffrey's bedroom. It sounded like a car had driven into their house at full speed. His brother screamed and he ran to see what the commotion was, and when he got to the bedroom, Jeffrey had completely disappeared. The floors and everything in his room had been swallowed up by the massive sinkhole that had finally opened up. His bed, dresser, TV, and nightstand were gone, and according to Jeremy, the hole was nearly 20 feet wide and 6 feet deep. As he looked down in the hole, all he could see was a heap of rubble and debris but he thought he heard his brother calling his name somewhere in the dark. So he jumped down into the hole and screamed for his brother. He thought he heard muffled cries in response, but as he crawled into the pit, he couldn't see anything. It was a large dark abyss that had swallowed everything in sight, and water began pooling into the hole. Meanwhile, Jeremy's wife called 911. The house just fell through. The bedroom floor just collapsed, and my brother-in-law is in there, and he's underneath the house. And police and firefighters arrived in minutes. When a local deputy entered the house, they found Jeremy still frantically searching for his brother in the sinkhole. The floor was giving away, and the dirt on the sides of the sinkhole was still falling in. But Jeremy didn't care. He desperately wanted to find his brother. As more emergency crews arrived, they knew that sinkholes were incredibly dangerous and unpredictable. So the deputy reached his hand down into the hole, grabbed Jeremy, and pulled him out. Then they made everyone exit the house. When rescue teams went back to monitor the sinkhole, it kept growing by the minute. Water continued pooling into the hole as the bedroom furniture collapsed inch by inch. To safely check for any sign of life in the hole, the crew attached a camera and a microphone to a string and lowered it into the hole. They listened through headphones hoping to hear Jeffrey's voice, but all they heard was flowing water and the crumbling debris as it sank further into the earth. As they listened for his voice, they heard another massive crash and the sinkhole collapsed even further. 
By that point, the hole was nearly 30 feet wide and 20 feet deep, but officials believe that the hole was nearly 100 feet wide below the surface. The rescue team considered their options, but as the sinkhole grew, they realized there was no safe way to search for Jeffrey. Fire rescue officials determined that the home was too unstable to continue rescue efforts by early Friday morning, and Jeremy stood in a neighbor's yard across the street in total disbelief that his brother had just been swallowed by the earth, and he heard the news that they couldn't continue their search efforts. Even if he was already dead, they knew it was far too dangerous to recover the body. They had no idea how long he had survived in the sinkhole, but they hoped he had died quickly. He most likely suffocated or was crushed to death by his bedroom furniture. In the end, the sinkhole would become his burial ground, and they never recovered his body. They eventually demolished the house when the surrounding areas were safe enough to operate around, and they filled the hole with asphalt, encasing Jeffrey in the hole. There's a small chance that his body could have been sucked into a nearby waterway underground, but as far as they knew, he would remain in the hole forever. They set up a fence around the hole and demolished the nearby houses, and in 2015, two years after the tragedy, the hole reopened. A sinkhole rarely reopens, but it's known to happen on occasion. The constant rain causes underground waterways to shift over time, and Jeremy watched as the news crews flocked to the scene where the house used to be, and again he was reminded of his brother Jeffrey, and the disturbing force of Mother Nature that swallowed him whole. Are you paying down old credit card debt? A personal loan could be your solution. Loans usually come with fixed monthly payments, making them a simple way to help pay off your credit cards. Plus, loans usually have lower interest rates than credit cards do. And Credit Karma can help you find the best option for you. Credit Karma uses your credit data to find loan offers that are personalized to you, so you can have a better idea of what loan amount you can get approved for. Credit Karma will even show you your chances of approval, so you can choose between loan offers that you're more likely to get approved for and apply with more confidence. Comparing loan offers on Credit Karma is 100% free, it won't affect your credit scores, and could save you money. Credit Karma, apply with more confidence today. I've used a personal loan before in order to consolidate all of my credit card debt when I got out of college into one fixed monthly payment, and I gotta tell you guys, this is the way to get out of debt. So if you're ready to apply, head to creditkarma.com slash loan offers to see personalized offers. Again, go to creditkarma.com slash loan offers to find the loan for you. That's creditkarma.com slash loan offers. Did you know cats are carnivores that need lots of meat? I didn't know leading cat food brands are often filled with fillers, grains, and very little protein. That's why I switched to Cat Person Cat Food. It's everything my kitties need to stay happy and healthy, high quality, high protein meals delivered right to my door, and they'll do the same for you. And if you order your starter box today, I've arranged for Cat Person to provide an exclusive offer of nearly 40% off just for my listeners. Cat Person delivers delicious, nutritious, and high quality cat food right to your door, and you'll never run out or have to settle for what the store has. Meal plans are fully customized for your cat and perfect for cats of all ages. There are 16 easy to serve wet foods and three different dry foods, so you'll be sure to find the combinations your cat will love. My kitties, for some reason, love the shreds and broth. They love that broth. That's the first thing they go after is they lap up all the broth before they eat the shreds, and they absolutely love all the flavors that Cat Person has to offer. And Cat Person offers a 30-day money-back guarantee on your custom plan, and if your cat doesn't love Cat Person, you get your money back. No questions asked. So what are you waiting for? All my kitties love Cat Person. I have three kitties, and after I switched them to Cat Person from all of the store-bought brands I was using before, the amount of waste they produced went down significantly. So that means less scooping, less throwing away nasty cat poop, and a much happier cat. So you and your cats are going to love Cat Person as much as I do. Go to catperson.com slash lights out and use code lights out to save nearly 40% off your starter box with free shipping. That's catperson.com slash lights out and use code lights out to get 40% off your starter box with free shipping. Seriously, the starter box is, is really cool. So check it out at catperson.com slash lights out and use code lights out. For our next unfortunate death, some say it was only a matter of time before machines would rise up against humans. But what we had in mind wasn't exactly how things worked out. For Elaine Herzberg, she became a victim before she even knew a machine was barreling straight toward her. And many are still unsure who or what was to blame. In 2016, Uber began launching its self-driving cars in several states across the U.S. and eventually made its way to Arizona. Self-driving cars don't need a human driver to steer or pedal but the name might be a bit misleading. 
Uber's self-driving car still required someone behind the wheel in case something went wrong. But what happens when both the autonomous car and the backup driver fail? Late on the evening of March 18, 2018, Elaine was traveling through the streets of Tempe, Arizona. She loaded up her bicycle with grocery bags, and by the time she reached Mill Avenue, she decided to cross the four-lane road around 10 p.m. She got off her seat and began walking her bike across the road in the dead of night. The road was nearly pitch black and the streetlights were few and far between. She got over halfway across the road when a self-driving Volvo dashed along the fourth and final lane. Barreling down Mill Avenue at 43 miles an hour, the car smashed into a lane with no hesitation. Her body took most of the hit as pieces of the vehicle blasted off of the front grille and left a large dent in the hood. Elaine flew off to the side and skidded across the asphalt as pieces of her skin peeled off on the road. A second later, the backup driver slammed on the brakes, finally bringing the car to a stop. But by then, it was already too late. Elaine had died almost instantly, and her body was mangled on the ground. Her bicycle and groceries were scattered across the pavement, and pieces of the self-driving car trailed across the scene. When paramedics finally arrived, they found Elaine completely unresponsive on the side of the road and they pronounced her dead only a half hour after the accident. And Elaine became the first victim to die by a self-driving car accident. The next day, Police Chief Sylvia Moyer was quick to blame Elaine for her own death. According to the rules of the road, Elaine shouldn't have been jaywalking across the street at night, and the self-driving vehicle had been going under the speed limit. The car's 360 scanner had failed to pick up Elaine, but the police chief said that even a vehicle with a human driver would have hit Elaine as she crossed the street at night. Police then released the footage of the dash cam, as well as footage from inside the vehicle. The backup driver, Rafaela Vasquez, could be seen looking down at her phone for almost a third of the time she was in the vehicle. And moments before the accident, police found that she had been watching an episode of The Voice rather than looking at the road. And as the investigation continued, people didn't know exactly who to blame. The fact is that more than 90% of all accidents are blamed on human error and nearly 1.35 million people die in car accidents every year, and both Elaine and Raffaella were being careless on the road. But the car scanner that was supposed to be superhuman also failed to see her. Regardless of who or what was truly to blame, Uber quickly discontinued their self-driving operations. Although we might think that the standard of self-driving cars is right around the corner, we need to remember that an unsuspecting pedestrian is also right around the corner, possibly in the dark, crossing the street. And our last strange death we're going to talk about today was known as the Dancing Plague. One of the most famous plagues during the Dark Ages was the Black Plague, which we've talked about in great detail here at Lights Out, which killed somewhere between 75 and 200 million people. That was more than half the people on Earth at the time. But a lesser known plague also passed over the Dark Ages, one that was much less tragic and more fun. The Dancing Plague of 1518 had upwards of 400 people dancing for days on end. The plague began in the middle of a hot July day in 1518. A housewife walked out of her home in Strasbourg, France, and randomly began dancing in the street. There was no music playing, but she felt compelled to dance as her husband watched in disappointment. She eventually stopped and went to sleep, but she was back at it by the next morning. This time a crowd began forming around her, and for hours on end she danced until her feet became bruised and bloodied, but she didn't care. She kept dancing as her neighbors came to watch. Slowly, others began joining in. Her energy was irresistible. The dancing plague spread, and soon enough, nearly 400 people were dancing in the street. But still, there was no music playing. Onlookers couldn't explain why they danced. And the dancers couldn't explain why they couldn't stop. Days passed, and people continued to dance as the summer heat came in brutal waves. It was so hot during those summer months that people began dying from exhaustion. It's estimated that up to 15 people a day were dying at the height of the dancing plague. The city council noticed the dancing had become a huge problem and reached out to local doctors. Doctors considered that astrobiological or supernatural causes could have been at play, but they eventually ruled them out. And they explained that the dancers had an illness called hot blood. They thought their brains were overheating, causing them to act strange. And they figured that the only way to cure the dancers was to get them to dance even more. So they brought out local musicians hoping to exhaust the dancers so they would go home. The musicians sped up the music and more dancers joined in, sweaty and frantic. The city council's plan had backfired, so they reconsidered their options. They then claimed that a curse had been put on the city. They thought God was upset with the sins of the townspeople, 
so they shut down every brothel and gambling venue in the city, and they also banished all of the prostitutes. But even then, people still kept on dancing. So of course the city tried to outlaw music and dancing, but nothing could stop them. The dancing plague went on. Many of the desperate dancers even prayed to God and his saints, hoping their dancing would end. But it was no use. A priest even handed out red shoes that had been blessed with holy oil. Some claimed that the holy shoes helped them stop dancing. But the plague went on for nearly two months, and no one could explain why. After months of dancing, it eventually died out, and the party ended. When a Swedish physician named Paracelsus visited the town, he researched the plague, and he ended up blaming it on the women. They claimed that the first woman to start dancing was only trying to avoid doing house chores, of course. And that was his only explanation. Modern experts suggest that food poisoning might have caused the convulsions. Certain fungi might have contaminated the town's supply of grain. And a psychoactive chemical similar to LSD might have been digested by the townsfolk, causing them to trip and dance uncontrollably. They might have continued to eat the grain, keeping them on an endless psychoactive trip. But some believe it wasn't a physical affliction at all. They believe it was an underground religious cult sent to the streets to cause a dancing mayhem. But many people died. So that would mean the cultists were willing to dance themselves to death for their strange cause. Some experts think the most likely cause of the dancing plague was a case of mass hysteria. Before the dancing outbreak, the city had suffered five serious famines in the previous decades. The last famine was only one year before the dancing outbreak. Smallpox and leprosy also spread through the town. So many believed the townspeople were under so much stress and trauma that their response was to dance until they died in a fit of hysteria. But whatever the truth behind the dancing plague was, one thing's for certain. We all missed out on a party of a lifetime. But with that, that wraps up 10 strange ways to die. And God, I mean, out of all the ones that we covered, which one, Joel, did you find the most disturbing or just the worst one, the worst way? Uh, for me, I would say the pressure cooker. Yeah, that was pretty pretty horrible. The yeah. meat grinder is like something out of my nightmares. <laughs> I was going to say, have you ever had nightmares about any yeah, of these? Yeah, like I wake up in time before I die because I think if I die, I'm, I'm dead. <laughs> you know? You've never died in a dream? No, have you? I have once. Really? Yeah, I died once, but then as soon as I died, I woke up. Oh, but okay. But most of the time, it's the same way for me too. Like I'll be right at, you know, I'll have somebody killing me or something mm -hmm. like that. It doesn't happen very often, but there'll be a dream where some something or somebody's going to kill me. And right before it happens, I wake up. You're up. And I'm like, oh shit, that was, that was crazy. That was, felt really real. But Gotcha. And then I would say the ones with the realism, which were, you know, the driving car, and the elevator, like sometimes I still get a creepy feeling inside an elevator. Oh, yeah. People get trapped in there all the time. I feel like elevators are super unsafe considering yeah. how how far advanced in technology we are. I feel like elevator technology is like lacking big mm -hmm. time. Like Definitely. I know most of them just hang on a cable. and Yeah, especially it, older buildings and stuff. Yeah. I'm sure like a lot of new buildings have like, you know, a lot more tech involved mm -hmm. in the lifts and stuff and, and safe, some safety stuff. precautions too i would think yeah yeah because i know in some airports for an example the elevator systems are so old that they have to get a rescue team in there like elevators below that door they get literally got to get a ladder yeah and then you never know if the power is gonna like freak out while they're trying to make the rescue and then they could all die yeah exactly well what's scary about some of these was that it was not necessarily like the elevator's fault. Mm -hmm. It was more so the technician working on the elevator. Oh yeah, didn't like forgot to mark that this elevator is malfunctioning due to a wiring issue, and so people got into it <sighs> by accident, thinking that it was working. Yeah, like that's you know I've I've had worked in buildings where elevators would go down. You know, elevator tech comes out is working on it, but then after they're done, I'm always like. Do I really want to get into this elevator? <laughs> like what happens if yeah. it just drops or true? I, I feel like that's a very real fear for most of us mm -hmm. of, of like being in an elevator, being squashed by an elevator or falling from, you know, from the top all the way down yeah. to the floor. And then in this story, the person was trapped in the doors yeah. and literally oh, got man. impaled slowly oh. while grinding on the, oh. oh, dude, that's gruesome. Horrible. Absolutely yeah. horrible. 
but yeah, let let us know what you think of this episode. I try, want to try something different, more real life horrors, because I feel like the real life horrors are sometimes even scarier yeah. than the paranormal ones, uh, because it's it's real life accidents, it's mm-hmm. tra- tragic things that happen that any of any one of us could experience. You know, hopefully none of us do experience that, but I think there's something just so freaky and, and weird about about some of these accidents and just you know there's really some of them are preventable but others are you know stuff just happens yeah. or like you're you're I mean, you know you work somewhere in a dangerous workplace and your coworker just happens to you know be a little sleepy that day and forgets to check the pressure cooker mm-hmm. before you know they start another batch it's just like oh it, it's scary stuff it is but yeah let us know which one scared you the most and let us know if there's other stories out there that you know of or other tragic and just horrible ways to die that we should cover in a future episode. But with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up today's episode there. Make sure you guys are subscribed to the show on YouTube as well as on Spotify. Make sure you're following us on social media at Lights Out Cast. We're also on TikTok now, which is really cool. We've been uh, growing our TikTok account quite a bit. We post a lot of clips and, and other things on there. So if you haven't checked that out yet, you can find us at Lights Out Cast on TikTok as well. But that is it for us today. And we will see you next time. Until then, lights out, everybody. <laughs>